Bartender, I'd like a large ale. Bartender says, why the big pause? <laughs> it's, it's the part I like to call warming up the speaker. Just get that, uh, that part. If you're just tuning in now, you haven't miss, missed much other than, uh, you know, getting ready. Five, five fifteen, five fish, you know. So these two guys are out walking their dogs, and one of the guys says, hey, we should go in and get a bite to eat at this restaurant. And uh, the other guy says, well, I can't. We can't. We have, we have our dogs with us. So the one guy says, don't worry about it. Just follow along. So he puts on his sunglasses, and he goes walking to the door of the restaurant, and the guy at the, at the host stops him and says, hey, you can't come in here with your dog. He's like, oh, no, it's my seeing eye dog. He's like, oh, sorry, sir, uh, right, th right this way. Do you need help at your table? He's like, no, I have a seeing eye dog. I'll be fine. Goes in. The next guy does the same thing. Puts on his glasses, goes to walk in the door. And the host stops him and says, sir, you're not allowed to bring your dog in here. He says, no, 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 this is my seeing eye dog. And, this, and the host says, your seeing eye dog is a chihuahua? And he says, they gave me a chihuahua? <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. Okay, cool. All right, and we're back. So if you're just tuning in, you haven't missed much. If you've stayed along with us for this entire ride, I so deeply appreciate that. All right, so here's our table of contents. Definition, intro to the anatomy, pathophysiology, Windsor autopsies, failed carpal tunnel, danger, safe options. So I want to cover a lot of the why this happens, how it happens, and then by that, I think that when we get to the end and say, hey, here's what you should do about it, um, it should be more obvious as to the why. Because I have given people recommendations and they're like, yeah, that's cool and all, but why would you recommend this versus that? And I think if you have a deep understanding of the mechanism of action, how things work and don't work, then you will be able to understand it and appreciate it better. All right, here we go. Tech neck, what? The heck, that's a little, a little cheeky. All right, so an overuse syndrome involving the head, neck, and shoulders, usually resulting from excessive strain on the spine, keyword spine, from looking in a forward and downward position at, at any handheld mobile device, cell phone, video game, computer, e-reader. Uh, this can cause headaches, neck pain, shoulder, and arm pain, breathing compromise, and much more. So here's the thing. Um, I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues about this, and she sent me a photo from the 1930s with a whole bunch of people all standing in a line up against a wall with their head like this looking down at a newspaper. It wasn't an e-reader, it was just paper. Um, and that also has a possibility. So it's not just technology, right? I've had some parents complain about their kids being on their technology too much, and then when the kid isn't using the technology, they have a coloring book. Or some of the people that they're not working at perhaps at a desk, they're working, um, I, I worked on professional chefs that work at their cutting board like this. this, right? So it's not just technology, it's more about posture, but what's interesting is the blue light that comes off of the screen has an impact on your brain and your eyes follow light which is where your attention goes, and then your head follows your eyes, and then the rest of your body moves with your posture. So there is a greater propensity for people to have bad posture when they are looking at a blue lit device. Okay, um, and it causes headaches, neck pain, shoulder pain, and arm pain, arm pain, arm, arm pain, arm pain. I'm gonna focus on that. Okay, here we go. Neck pain, headaches, numbness, fingers, hand, wrist, elbow, shoulder, the entire kinetic chain from the neck down to the fingertips. That's important because if you notice, we talk about tech neck and carpal tunnel. 
that is a huge distinction that we need to make because if you're not treating the right thing, you're gonna end up with lots of problems and that'll come to be obvious here. So if you notice in the picture here, there's a ball and chain. The ball is labeled 60 pounds. Staring down at a mobile device places 60 pounds of stress on your neck and spine resulting in poor posture. So for every inch, your ear is past your shoulder. Here's tip number one. For every inch, your ear is past your shoulder, puts an extra 10 pounds of stress on your neck. In our office, we have a screening tool where we take a picture of somebody from the front, somebody from the side, and we can actually measure their posture to see how crooked they are and to see how tipped they are or how they lean. Um, because what we're looking at is weight with leverage. And weight with leverage is like a crowbar. You can put extra pressure on something uh, and that something is usually your disc. Okay, so everybody agree this is bad? Okay, here we go. Tech neck is the term used to describe the flexed head and neck position that occurs when looking down at your smartphone. Now, he's looking at a smartphone. He could be looking at anything. Crossword Sudoku doesn't really matter, but if you notice, heads forward, down, and here. And the big issue comes with the chronic posture that goes along with that, and it's the chronicity of it. If you're using your phone all the time, then that, re that repetition is gonna build up on you and cause breakdowns. So, here's your neck. It's complicated. You have all these different ligaments. This is one view. Uh, it's kind of an exploded view, but you have a lot going on in there. Can we just appreciate that this is demonstrating a lot? Okay, here's it for, here it is from the top, here it is from the side. So, the spinal cord's in the middle. Here's part of the bone that goes to the back. The nerve goes across that. If we look at that from the side view over here, we can see the nerve comes up in the space between the two bones. So if you compress this, it's gonna pinch that and wherever this thing goes is gonna have some problems. Yeah, everybody up with the, with the anatomy of it? Why does my neck always hurt? My, the thing I love about this picture is he's sitting in probably a, one of the most advanced ergonomic chairs. You can see there's struts and springs under here. There's a headrest along with a neck rest and a bunch of, and look, look sitting like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, just all crunched up. Um, and okay, so one of the things I've seen in clinic is a lot of people because of work from home situations have been working from laptops and laptops are terrible for your posture. You either need to get a separate screen or a separate keyboard and put your laptop up on a, on a stand of some kind. Um, some people actually use a different laptop to prop their laptop up if you're fancy, or you can just get a stand. Anyway, um, so you could have the best equipment, but if you're not using it right, it's not gonna do you any good. It's the carpal tunnel, Doc. Um, I hear this all the time, but I'd like to point out to you something. Are you sure it's carpal tunnel? Because if you look at the red arrow, that's where the carpal tunnel lives. Everything else north of the wrist meaning away from the fingers towards the body. Blue arrow, blue arrow, blue arrow. Those are not carpal tunnel symptoms. Where the wrist is, that's carpal tunnel symptoms. And we're gonna talk about that too because a problem well-defined is half solved. So what is it then? Here's carpal tunnel, beautiful picture. Got this from the Atom database. They have really good information out there. If you notice, the carpal tunnel isn't really even in the wrist it's basically in the palm of the hand. And if you notice, here's the distribution. It spares the pinky, it's half of the ring finger, it's the other three fingers, and it's here. Carpal tunnel's here. This is not the carpal tunnel, this is not the carpal tunnel. What happens a lot of times in medicine is we truncate, abbreviate, and we look to get to a diagnosis quickly. And sometimes when we use common terms, it helps people understand that they have a problem and they should get it treated. The issue with that is if we don't define it correctly, there, are in, there ends up to be what are called like junk terms or general diagnoses. If we, if somebody says, hey, I have wrist pain, and we say, oh, that's a cervical radiculitis, they're like, no, no, cervical is in my neck, it's my wrist, right? Or they self-diagnose, oh, my friend had a pain here and they called it carpal tunnel, I have that same thing, therefore it's called the same thing and it's not. We see this all the time with piriformis syndrome versus radiculitis versus sciatica, because everybody calls it sciatica, even though it, there's specific diagnostic criteria that determine whether it is or actually is not. Um, and that's super important, because this is carpal tunnel syndrome. This is not carpal tunnel syndrome. Cervical radiculitis, these are what are called dermatomes. So if you have a specific pain that goes down to your thumb 
into your index finger, into your, your fourth and fifth digits, or even up the back of your arm, it's not carpal tunnel. It comes from the neck. It comes from the nerves in the neck. And that's called a cervical radiculitis or a cervical radiculopathy. It radiates and it's either an itis, which is an inflammation, or it's a, path, a pathology of some kind. So here we go. C5, C6, C7. And it shows up in the distribution all the way down the arm. And if you look, it can show up in just those fingers. That's, this is six and this is seven. Um, and if you have pinch in the neck, now, if you've seen my other talk, if you've seen my whiplash talk, we talk a lot about why C5 is so important, why so many times problems come from that area. That is the lower anchor point of the upper complex. That is one of the dural anchor points. And when you have tension in your entire spine, it pulls there. The spinal cord does not like to be under tension, so you end up with cramping, muscle tension, compression of the disc. When that happens, it can pinch the nerve and it can send pain and problems into your shoulder or all the way down your arm. Now, if you have pain in your hand because of a pinched nerve in your neck, because of tension in your spinal cord, where should you put the, the treatment? What should you treat? The wrist, the neck, or the whole spinal system? The answer is the whole spinal system. Because if you treat the wrist, is it gonna work? Probably not. Okay. This is also cervical radiculitis. This is what I just talked about, how you can have degeneration in the neck, you get a pinched nerve. So these nerves branch. If it's pinched before the branch, it affects motor. You can't move it as well. It hurts after a while. Sensory, you get weird numbness, tingling, and pins and needles. And then autonomic, that's what controls things like your heart and your organs. We'll talk about that in a second. But that's bad, and that's not, that is not in the wrist. This is a picture from the front. Shows the collarbone, shows the brachial plexus, and a bunch of other things going on in there. If these muscles get tight, it can pinch the nerves that pass through them, and that can go down as well. So that can cause a cervical radiculitis. So we can have it here from the disc, or here from the muscles, or we can have another condition that very few people even talk about. It's called double crush also known as serial compression syndrome. I'll tell you, if you look up serial compression syndrome, you'll probably find compartment syndrome because it's very, very common in the legs. It's not commonly described in the hand. Why? Because most of the stuff that's described in the neck and the hand is either described as cervical radiculitis or as carpal tunnel. But double crush or serial compression happens a lot. In fact, it's the most common cause of problems in the hand. Unless you've had a direct trauma to the hand, it's coming from the spine and usually some, uh, some other areas down the line because double crush may be more than double. If you notice, every one of these arrows is a common pinch point for the nerves that go to the hand. It can happen at the neck, it can happen in the muscles, it can happen in the collarbone, it can happen by the armpit, it can happen just by the, the transition between the biceps and the deltoid, it can happen by the elbow down or on the, so on the front or the, on the back. So common flexor tendon, common extensor tendon. So that's where those arrows point, or it can actually happen right here at the carpal tunnel. See that white strip? That's the carpal tunnel. So it can happen there too. And that's the problem. If we just find it here and don't look at all the rest of this stuff, then guess what we're missing? The rest of the stuff. That's why it's not very successful just to treat the wrist. Okay. As you climb the ladder of success, be sure it's leaning against the right building. That's H. Uh, Jackson Brown Jr. A problem well-defined is half solved. There's no sense in climbing a ladder that's leaning against the wrong wall. This basically says if you do not understand the entirety of what you're working on, when you, start, when you set out to work on it, you might miss the essence, the most important part. Okay, carpal tunnel, key points. We're gonna wrap this part up and then move into some of the other things that we found to give you some background and some information. Okay, carpal tunnel hurts in the first three fingers. It's worse when pressure is applied to the palm. It's better when the arm bones are squeezed together. There's a couple of tests you can do for this, but the simplest one is if you push on it and it hurts, and it hurts in those three fingers, then it's potentially at least carpal tunnel. Can you have more than one problem at a time? 
Absolutely. Do most people have more than one problem at a time? Absolutely. Because by the time it broke down, your body's run out of biological efficacy to heal. So you're already in a, a place where your body needs extra help. Okay. Cervical radiculitis. If you notice the picture says cervical radiculopathy. Two conditions, one's just more advanced. Okay, pain starts in the neck and goes to the hand. It affects other areas, shoulder, back, chest. So if you have a pain that in the wrist and it hurts everywhere else up here, it's probably this. Double crush, pain in the neck and the hand, usually at the wrist or higher. And it can also affect other joints, such as the elbow and the shoulder. So this is where it can affect the entire kinetic chain. If you notice, pinch one, pinch two, right? Vladimir Goloshevskinsky did a great job writing a book all about double crush. It's a fantastic book. Um, the picture up here is a, is a neuron, and this is the axon that goes all the way down. That's in your brain. This is what goes to your muscle. And everything in between your brain and whatever muscle is affected can have a pinch along the route. All right, so here's some of the things that people say to talk themselves out of taking care of themselves. Don't be a stubborn old mule. Okay, it's just a tingle. Oh, that's not my dominant hand. Oh good, you got an extra one. Okay, um, it'll probably go away. No, it won't. All right, let's go back to this. Hold on, there. All right, so here's what happens. If the pain goes away, then there's numbness and tingling, then it goes to weakness, and then it goes to atrophy. So, numbness and weakness are closer to death than is pain. So if the pain goes away and it still doesn't work right, guess what? It didn't get better, it got worse. Do, do, do. We back? Do we do we miss anything? Last, uh, huh? Last oh. All right. So, if you wait for it to be really bad to deal with it, you've already missed a lot of opportunities. Sometimes, if a nerve gets damaged, it doesn't recover at all. And most of the time, if it gets damaged, it doesn't recover fully. That's not something you want to mess with, especially if you have bony pathology. Okay, um, I just slept on it wrong. If sleeping hurts you, you already have a problem. Okay. Oh, I love this picture. It's poorly drawn, but it explains a lot. Um, the irony is not lost on me. When I was doing this presentation, I was like, man, my neck kind of bothered me. Then I realized I was not sitting right. Every organ in your body is connected to the one under your hat. Why it's more important than just carpal tunnel or tech neck. Diseased organs found on autopsy with evidence of spinal degeneration and misalignment of the same level feeding nerve supply to the organ. Um, so basically, Dr. Henry Windsor, he was a medical pathologist. He did this, uh, this study was released about 100 years ago. This is not new information. What he found was the, deter uh, the connection that existed between minor curvatures of the spine and the diseased organs. So basically, if a nerve comes from the spine and goes to an organ, if that part of the spine stops functioning or it gets misaligned, it makes it so the organ stops regenerating and eventually breaks down either into disease or death. What organ, you might ask? We'll get to that part in a minute. So when, if he included the cadaver results with a faint curve and a slight uh, visceral pathology, the correlation was, uh, was 100%, 139 times out of 139 instances, they found that if there is a change in your spinal system, there is a change in your organ system. 
And it's the spine that lets the body break down because it's the nerves that regenerate the organs. Now, this is internal stuff. Remember we talked about nerves because motor, sensory, and autonomic. This is talking about the autonomic connection to the organs. I go, go into that real deep on the brain-gut connection talk. But what this is saying is if there's a pinched nerve, it's going to affect all three. So this is saying evidence of definitely one of those components is demonstrated here. But it's also very possible that it can affect motor and sensory in, in the limbs as well. Okay, so ordinary diseases of the adult life, everything, cancer of the larynx, fatty degeneration of the thymus, pleural adhesions, that's in the lungs, pleurisy, uh, pleural effusions, that's fluid in the lungs, pneumonia, tuberculosis, pulmonary edema, more fluid in the lungs, pulmonary congestion, lung fibrosis, that means you have COPD and it's hard to breathe, bronchitis, enlarged lymph nodes, influenza, the flu, heart endocarditis, heart dilation, heart muscle degeneration, pericarditis, aortic aneurysm, what? Yeah, from, from pinched nerves, aneurysm of the heart, liver cirrhosis, liver swelling, liver tumors, enlarged spleen. And here's the thing. These organs were selectively and demonstrably worse than other organs in the same human body. And they were worse as correlated to the nerve that comes off of the spine that goes to those organs. So you can't just say, oh, well, that person probably had a lifestyle that made their liver worse. Their lifestyle made everything bad. It's just that was the cause of death. Liver tumors, enlarged spleen, it atrophied spleen. Wait a second. It's either bigger or it's smaller. Yes. It can either break down either to the excess or to the, or to the deficient, but it's not healthy either way. Inflamed spleen, pancreas degeneration, cystic kidneys, appendicitis, uterine adhesions, prostate hypertrophy, prostate atrophy, cystitis, hydrocele, osteomyelitis, etc. This is a small sample. This just this list just kept going because of a pinched nerve somewhere in the body, making it so the body doesn't regenerate itself. All right. Why does my back hurt? Also me. <laughs> okay. Surgical outcomes of carpal tunnel release. Now we're gonna to start to talk about what happens. Let's talk about common approaches. What happens when? Using 24 matched pairs of surgical and non-surgical cases, the authors found significant improvements in both groups. Both groups had significant improvements. After, and they did, they did this test after six years of follow-up. With the surgical group did improve more, but the differences in the scores between the two groups were reportedly modest. That means there was some difference, but it wasn't huge for people that had the surgery or people that didn't have the surgery. That tells, is very telling. Okay. However, recent paper by Pet Penzi uh, presented the evidence suggesting that high success rate of carpal tunnel release are result of the natural history or the progression of the disease rather than the surgical procedure itself. This is what they're saying. The, the differences were measurable, but the surgery wasn't really what made a person get better. It wasn't significantly different enough to say that the surgery was like absolutely the best thing that happened. The results are indicative of carpal tunnel release being less effective than we currently estimate. Well, let's see what the actual data says. Here's surgical outcomes of carpal tunnel release surgery. 42% reported ongoing pain. 42% got the surgery, still had pain. 32% had digital numbness, numbness in the fingers. 35% had tingling still. 57% reported a return of at least some preoperative symptoms at the uh, beginning and an average of two years after surgery. Well, they got two good years, didn't they? No. Why? Because the average time to maximum improvement would, took 9.8 months. So it took 9.8 months to get the maximum benefit. And then by two years, 57% of them had something come back. What does that tell you? Either the surgery doesn't fix the problem or they're not applying it to the right place or the surgery itself causes the problem to come back. Either way, these are the results that show up. Now, if we compare that to this here, where it says they had similar outcomes with or without the surgery. Well, then what's the point? Why does my back hurt so much? Also, 
<laughs> Shrimp. Okay, let's talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. These are things like ibuprofen, aspirin, acetaminophen, over-the-counters. This is not the big heavy-duty fancy stuff. This is what you get. Take two of these and call me in the morning, right? Okay. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are amongst the most widely prescribed medication in the world. Their use is associated with significant morbidity. Significant morbidity. Problems happen because of this, including gastrointestinal, which is your gut digestion, renal, your kidneys, and hepatic liver effects. This bad. Those are your filters. That's how you get nutrition in. That's how you get toxins out. Nutrify the body, detoxify the body. That's where these cause problems. Other and less common effects include otic, well, that's ear, central nervous systems. These affect your brain and spinal cord. The very thing that you're trying to fix by fixing the nerves. Okay. Opth ophthalmic, which is eyes, allergic and dermatologic effects. Okay. If you haven't seen my series on allergies, we talk all about the inflammatory cycles and systems and yeah, these cause some problems. All right. This is directly from PubMed. Patient awareness through education is crucial in decreasing. What is the goal? Decrease morbidity and preventing the adverse effects from these drugs. Basically they say, you have to educate people. That's what they said, that's what we're doing. I'm people, I'm educating y'all, here we go. Crucial for decreasing the morbidity and preventing adverse effects from these drugs. These drugs are not safe. They're common, people have gotten used to them. So, the, and it's also a less invasive method than surgery. But we can ask the question, is it the most effective? Are those side effects acceptable? in the treatment of this disease process. Do you want to have brain problems, liver, kidney, and gastrointestinal problems? No. Idiosyncratic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Do you see the word idiosyncratic? That means it causes problems that it, they don't expect it should cause. It's, a non, it's an anti-inflammatory that causes inflammation. What? Okay cause GI, that's gastrointestinal, liver and bone marrow toxicity in some patients, which result in gastrointestinal bleeding, ulceration, hepatic failure, hepatitis, and a fancy kind of anemia. That's a problem. All while you're trying to heal. This is just to bring the inflammation down. Remember, this isn't dealing with the source cause. This isn't dealing with the origination of the problem. This is just helping to relieve your symptoms. Are you willing to trade symptoms for these problems? I would say no. Toxic mechanisms proposed have been reviewed. Evidence is presented showing that idiosyncratic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs form pro-oxidant radicals. What? The problem is inflammation. You know what causes inflammation? Free radicals, pro-oxidants. You know antioxidants? Antioxidants are good and helpful because they get rid of those. This actually causes them. So you get a short-term benefit with a long-term detriment. That's a cycle that breaks people down. It, and it's metabolized by peroxidases. Those are enzymes in the body. Um, and those are present within these tissues. Okay, bad for the boys. Here's a conclusion from an interesting study about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We conclude that concentrations relevant to human exposure, these are not excessive amounts. These are normal ways that people normally use them. What happened? Early window of sensitivity within the first trimester. This is for pregnant moms. Ibuprofen causes direct endocrine disturbances in the human fetal testis and alteration of the germ cell biology. We're going to do a talk on epigenetics and it's going to be amazing. I touched on it a bunch in allergies. Um, but this is one of those things. This can cause troubles with the genes that are inherited and passed down to your children from these drugs. It's also bad for the girls. Here's a case study um, that really illustrates the point. There's a bunch of case, there's a bunch of his, history and research and a bunch of lab science. This is a case study I wanted to grab because it illustrates the point very well. 38 year old woman on paroxicam for hip osteoarthritis, secondary to hip dysplasia. So she had inflammation of a hip uh, because it was not where it should have been. Um, had secondary sterility. These drugs sterilize this woman, secondary, meaning she didn't naturally have sterility, but these drugs made her sterile so she could not be fertile and have children because of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that she was on, specifically paroxicam. 
ova collected for in vitro fertilization, so she's going to go for IVF, were immature and failed to fertilize. Why? Further attempts done after paroxicam discontinuation. So they took her off the drugs, and she produced seven mature ova that fertilized, allowing embryo implantation. So on the drugs, didn't happen. Took her off, boom. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may induce infertility by reducing the production of prostaglandins, that's PGE2. Um, that's a chemical classification that helps with cell signaling inside your body. If you want everything to run right, you can't shut it down. It has to run its course. There's a huge conversation with inflammation. Do you stop it or do you get it done faster, right? Obviously, everybody agrees that we should not remain inflamed. It's bad for you. Um, but <laughs> we good? Okay. Yeah. All right. Did I miss anything? No. Okay, cool. All right. So basically what they're saying because of this study that the anti-inflammatory drug therapy needs to be evaluated because of its effect on reproductive function. All right. 2017 healthcare providers across the U.S. wrote more than 191 million prescriptions for opiate. Um, now we're talking about opiates. It's a, it's a pain medication at a rate of 58.7 prescriptions per 100 people. That means over 50% of the people, now granted, some of these were not written appropriately, but they're just handing out a bunch of opiates. So that's in 2017. Let's see what happens. Despite guidelines to limit opiates as a first approach managing most chronic pain, a study found primary care clinicians wrote 45% of all opiate prescriptions in the United States. Why would you do that? If that's the only tool you have, Right. It was told to me very early on, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Right. Now, here's the thing. I, I want to make this very clear. I think, that, I think that primary care physicians are good doctors. I think they genuinely care about patients and they want them to get better. I think that they are limited by the standard of care and the industry that they're in gives them a select amount of tools. And they're not really designed to be there to do with chronic problems. We've talked about this before. This is a common theme. They're not great at chronic conditions. They're great at acute conditions. They can save your life. Their whole medical responsibility, as it was described to me in medical school, is the, to prevent the loss of life and limb. Chronic pain, not really something they're equipped to deal with. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that happens because of this. And I was part of an opiate coalition for Lake County. And there was about 50 people there. Most of them were law enforcement and government officials. There was one other doctor there. And his job was, he was basically the addiction doctor. He was helping people get off of the addictions. There was nobody there that specialized in chronic pain. And I asked the question, why do people even want opiates? Why, why do people seek these out? Most people, their first drug dealer is their doctor. And they don't even want the drugs. I hear people all the time saying, I don't want the drugs, I don't want to be on prescriptions, because it causes problems. What kind of problems? More than 11 million people misuse prescription opiates in 2017. Whoops. Every day, more than 1,000 people are treated in emergency departments for misusing prescription opiates. 27 prescription, uh, 2017 prescription opiates were involved in more than 35% of all opiate overdose deaths. Nearly 17,000 deaths. Do you want... That, most people don't want that. Most people don't want to be on drugs. They want to be out of pain. Does that make sense? That's reasonable. Most people want to be out of pain. And the opiates really aren't the problem. Just like alcohol isn't a problem. It's just a bad solution. It fixes the, it fixes the pain temporarily without solving the problem. So let's get down to the bottom of this. 
from 1999 to 2017, almost 218,000 people in the United States died. Died from overdoses related to prescription opiates. CDC estimates that the total economic burden of the prescription of opiate misuse in the United States, seven, sorry, $78.5 billion a year, including the cost of health care, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice involvement. Look how many other, okay, so health care I get, but look, lost productivity, addiction treatment, and criminal justice? One of my patients came to me and says, I had a really bad neck pain from a car crash. And when I went to my doctor, I left with more pain and eventually ended up getting a drug addiction because of this. It's not the right tool. And we should find better ways to do it because this is awful. Trigger points in the shoulder can occur due to forward head posture. So if you have chronic shoulder pain, Remember we talked about the serial compression or double crush? Pain in the shoulder comes from forward head posture. If you lean your head forward, it's gonna put extra pressure on your neck. That's tech neck. Don't take chances, let's play it safe. We talked about how many people died and how dangerous surgeries are. Um, and I don't think that all surgeries are bad. I don't think that should be the first line of defense. Um, the number of people I've had come to see, come to see me and they've said, my, I talked to my orthopedist Nice person. They're great. I think they can totally help me, but they say that I'm not bad enough and I have to wait for things to break down before I go to see them. And I said, well, what are you going to do while you're waiting around? We could probably help you out, get it better, or if nothing else, make it so that when you, if you do have to get surgery, that you go through it better. And there's ways to do that. There's actually a bunch of ways to do that. So if surgery is inevitable, there are things you could do ahead of time to make it easier and more likely that you're going to be successful with it, right? If you need it, great. Let's make sure that you get through it as good as you possibly can. All right, so ergonomics. This is something that you can do. I'm sure you've seen this. Feet flat on the floor. Adjust the height of the chair so the knees and the hips sit at 90-90. Adjust the backrest so that there's a lumbar support. So there's actually a metric for the lumbar support. You should have six inches of, of compression in your lower back to give you proper spinal support. Elbows at 90 degrees, backrest comfortably against the backrest, head is in the neutral, chin is parallel to the ground. Um, that's the anatomical chin, not all the other stuff under here. So, you know, for me, I'd have to really, you know, check a jaw. I think it should say jaw because chin, I mean, that's debatable, right? Which one, how far down, which angle, I don't know. Take the jaw. Uh, jaw is parallel to the ground. Fingers are relaxed with the wrists straight. Place a monitor arm's length away. Now, I can tell you, like we said, eyes follow light and attention. Your head follows your eyes. Your posture follows your head. So if your screen is too low and too far away, the tendency is to lean in. If you, ha if you need to see better, bring the monitor closer. Bring it higher. I've had people fix significant chronic issues in their hands just by bringing the monitor to where they thought was too close so they wanted to lean away. And then when they did that, guess what? Boom, they put themselves in good posture. Nice. Okay, uh, position the top of the monitor at eye level. So that way you're looking comfortably directly in front of you. Uh, and that's what this says here. <laughs> okay. Uh, and this is sometimes how people get it wrong. You can see over here, over here, and then whatever this guy's doing. I mean, really. Okay, chiropractic. Remember we talked about? how every nerve is associated with an organ function, that, that information is over 100 years old. It can not only help with your brain and your posture and your eyes and your vision and your digestion and all those other things, but it can also help to make sure that you don't have chronic degenerative conditions that by the time they show up, they're hard to fix. Start early, get adjusted regularly, and it will absolutely help you. All right, significant, okay, so let's talk specifically, generally here, specifically, let's go down our bullets. Significant decrease in symptoms and at three weeks. How long does it take to recover from a surgery? Six weeks? Eight weeks? How about in three weeks, you could have significant improvement? Scientifically documented, chiropractic is awesome. Okay. Improves pain symptom severity. It improves function, so a functional loss symptom severity. So if you have numbness, tingling, or weakness, getting adjusted helps with carpal tunnel. Why? Because it was misdiagnosed. 
If getting your neck adjusted fixes your carpal tunnel, it's not carpal tunnel. It's not carpal tunnel. It's double crush or cervical radiculitis or cervical radiculopathy. But who cares? You got wrist pain, you get adjusted, it's better. Not only in pain, but, but loss symptom. It improves mental distress with, associated with loss of function. So if your hand stops working and you can't do your job, what does that mean for your life? If you have to like take care of your kids or take care of your loved ones, or maybe just getting in and out of the car, maybe carrying things around, like how well do you feel able to do your job, to keep your job, um, to you know, prepare food for yourself? If you start losing hand function, that's emotionally stressful. And that's, they said mental distress, but mental emotional. Um, and that, that can be positively impacted by getting adjusted. And there's plenty of ways to get adjusted that aren't, if you're afraid of getting your neck cracked, that's totally fine. And I know it's, it's blasphemy to say crack your neck. I'm a chiropractor, have some respect. It's a specific adjustment procedure. Uh, that's fine. And you can call it whatever you want to call it. You need to fix the problem. There's plenty of, there's plenty of other safer ways to do that. Um, and we'll talk about that too. So what does the research say? It says it's safe and effective alternative to medication and surgery. Just chiropractic by itself is a safe alternative to surgery and medications. So that's one thing that works just as well as the other things that we've talked about that don't work, okay? Or don't work as well as they should, okay. Rounded shoulders is a classic sign of poor posture. If you slump, bad times. Acupuncture, it's as effective as oral steroids. Getting acupuncture helps to bring down your inflammation. Why? Because it activates your endogenous pathways. Your brain makes more chemistry than you could ever take from outside. Acupuncture releases those. And there's a whole big long conversation about that. Uh, but here we have a way to prove it. Decreased waking up at night. So a lot of times people that have carpal tunnel, when they sleep, and they have their neck in an odd position. Oh, if your neck's in an odd position, what's that have to do with your wrist? It doesn't, it's not carpal tunnel. It is serial compression, double crush, cervical radiculitis. It's a neck problem. If your neck makes your hand worse, it's your neck, not your hand. Okay, but acupuncture can decrease the waking up at night. You have better long-term outcomes for pain and function. Better, it's better with acupuncture. Effective for 90% of patients. Acupuncture can fix it for 90% of the people. Okay, it corrects the hand function at the brain level. So there's a really cool thing with acupuncture. It looks at all the different representational systems of the body and says, hey, you know what? There's a representation of the hand in the hand. There's a representation of the hand in the head. There's also a representation of the hand in the ear. There's also a representation of the hand in the foot. And there's different reflexes all over the body. So you, and it, it controls it at the center of control in the brain. So it works, it's awesome, it's easy, and it's better than most options. Fantastic, moving on. 15 degrees of forward bending can increase the stress of your head on your, uh, of stress of your head on your neck by three times. And that's from the uh, Columbia Spine Journal. Okay, PT rehab, it's effective as, as effective as surgery at one, three, six, and 12 month measures. So it's at least as good as surgery. What's interesting to me is if they send somebody for surgery, after the surgery, what do they do? Rehab. Guess what? You could probably start with rehab and it could help. It improves pain symptom severity and it improves functional loss symptom severity. Guess what? It works. Muscle strengthening can help reduce neck pain and improve posture. Rehab, neck. Why do we treat the neck in carpal tunnel? Because it's probably not carpal tunnel. Okay, massage therapy. This one's fantastic. Now, let me point out something to you. I, I googled massage therapy, carpal tunnel. And in almost every picture I found, Looked like this. Do you see what I'm? Do you see what I'm seeing? Where are they massaging? Where's the carpal tunnel? This is the carpal tunnel. Massage, massage. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. 
I'm saying that that's not the carpal tunnel they're massaging. They're massaging all the stuff that comes and goes to it. That's probably serial compression. Neurodynamic techniques, which are some of the things we're going to show you, nerve flossing, uh, neurodynamic, moving the nerves, functional massage, and carpal bone mobilizations. Mobilizations, that is adjustments, basically, versus laser and ultrasound therapy. So they compared two groups of techniques. They checked nerve conduction, pain sensitivity, symptom severity, and functional status before and after. And they used the, the technique for uh, the carpal tunnel, Boston carpal tunnel questionnaire. Okay, so they did a standard questionnaire. They looked before and after treatment. Therapy was conducted twice a week for 20 sessions. That's 10 weeks. Both therapies had a positive effect on nerve conduction. So nerve conduction, they're actually electrophysiology. They're checking the electricity of the nerve. So they both worked. Both sets of techniques worked. Pain reduction and functional status and subjective symptoms with individual carpal tunnel uh, syndrome. However, the results regarding pain reduction, subjective symptoms, and functional status were better in the massage therapy group. So, or manual therapy group, I think is what they're referring to there. Uh, but using massage as part of a, a more broad approach with other physical techniques. Um, we do pretty much all of these in clinic except for the ultrasound. So you can get the benefit of all of it. Okay, so that was awesome. Forward head posture is associated with neck stiffness, pain, and tenderness. One of my favorite products. Why? Because head to head, toe to toe, this works better than non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Boom. Let's go. Safer, more effective. Okay. Research proven supplement for inflammation and the healing that works faster, more efficient, or sorry, more, faster, more effective, and has less negative side effects on the body than non steroidal anti-inflammatories. There are better options available. When you know better, you do better. Here we go. Here's a fun study. Okay, acute is the safer placement for non steroidal anti-inflammatories. Not only does it lack the negative side effects commonly associated with, uh, with them, like liver and kidney damage, it will heal you faster. You get better faster with less damage. Why? If your liver and kidneys are being damaged, what do you think your biological priority is? Your inflammation or your organs that sustain life? you're diverting biological resources to fix those problems. Okay, so minutes it took for inflammatory markers to decrease. With acute, this is a double blind study by the way, just about 30 minutes. If you look over here, about 90 minutes. So if you took an ibuprofen and your friend took an acute, guess who's getting better faster? By 300%, 30 minutes, 90 minutes. What do you want to do? Oh, and by the way, without taking anything, it was about 70 minutes. Why would you think that would happen? Because your body's responding to that as a, as a poison because it's not familiar with it. This has biological activity that your body already knows to do with. All right. Studies show you heal 30, you heal 33% faster with this holistic anti-inflammatory. So amount of inflammation after two hours. Less with acute, less with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, and if you have no if you have no NSAIDs on board, it takes longer. So it works. It it you works just as fast, but you heal way faster. There's a bunch of studies that was done on this to prove this. Um, these all are vetted, scientific, documented. Athletes that take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories they control inflammation and decrease the pain, but the muscle is not in a is in a non-regenerative phase. So if you get damage and then you get inflammation, you take a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, it stops the inflammation, but it doesn't correct the damage. It shuts down the whole process. That's how you get cumulative, repetitive traumas that eventually lead to more significant breakdowns. This is what takes athletes out of the game. All right. In other words, by inhibiting the prostaglandin production, non steroidal anti-inflammatories interfere with the healing and recovery of the injured muscles. Again, shuts the pain down without fixing the problem. That's, a, that's set up a recipe for disaster. Okay, cortisone and other cor uh, corticosteroids suppress the symptoms associated with acute inflammatory process but compromise the recovery process. So what if somebody gets, a, what if somebody gets an injection, right? Oh, well, you have inflammation, let's give you an injection. Guess what happens? The tissue breaks down faster. It stops the recovery process. It shuts off the pain. Sometimes that's necessary, right? But it makes it worse and it compromises the recovery process. It, it can actually break your tissue down and set you up for a much worse injury. 
There was a study that was done, double blind study, measured the healing rate of black eyes, bruises of the lips, ears, chest, and arms of 146 boxers. These people are getting hit. Okay. 74 boxers received the proteolytic enzymes that are found in the acute, and 72 received placebo until the symptoms disappeared. In 58 of the 74 boxers with the enzyme group, they found that the black eyes completely disappeared within four days. Within the, within the same time frame, only 10 subjects taking the placebo exhibited the complete recovery. So the majority of people taking the enzymes got better faster, and very, very few people in the other group got better in the same time frame. Okay. Uh, there's a study conducted 72 soccer players who had suffered soft tissue injury and skin abrasions. The researchers administered enzymes immediately after injury. Results of the study showed 80% of the cases had a more rapid recovery with this, with this process. 80% people got better using this process. Uh, it's awesome. In addition to anti-inflammatory activity, enzymes can inhibit the formation of blood clots. Can we please just take a moment to appreciate blood clots can kill you. And if you happen to be exposed to something that is toxic, that perhaps is an outside problem, um, this happens sometimes in viruses as well, uh, or chemical reactions that happen in the body. They can cause blood clots. They can cause blood clots in your legs. They can cause blood clots in your lungs, in your heart, into the brain. If it goes to the brain, it can be a stroke. This inhibits the formation of blood clots while helping you heal faster. Okay. Pennsylvania Medical Journal reported on a study, oral proteolytic enzymes in the treatment of athletic injuries, a double-blind study. If you get down here, statistically significant in reaction predicted in the predicted time compared to the placebo. They confirmed that oral enzymes accelerate healing. This whole big thing says if you do this process, you will get better faster. And sometimes you're putting problems. So we talked about sports. We've talked about infection. We've talked about direct trauma to the body. But what happens if your direct trauma to the body is you sitting at a keyboard all day? You can't shut down the process because then yesterday will build up on today, which will build up on tomorrow. And if you shut down the healing process, eventually you will break down. This accelerates your timetable so you get better faster. So then by the end of today, today's damage is already worn off and you're ready to move on to the next day. This is the right way to do it. Fisher and Trethart, 1996, report that the combination of proteolytic enzymes and antioxidants. Remember what happened when you take ibuprofen? It causes pro-oxidant radicals. It makes you worse. If you take the things that make you better, turns out, if you have an acute injury, within the first 24 hours, you take proteolytic enzymes anti and antioxidants, it has a down-regulating effect on the acute inflammatory process. So instead of the fire getting all the way to rage out of control, it blunts it so that you get better faster. This is where it's at. So they found that the proteolytic enzymes and the antioxidants in the early stages after sports injury for the persons recovering from, or persons recovering from surgical procedures. If you have to get surgery, this will get you better faster. It's proven by science. Has also found that this combination benefited conditions such as atherosclerosis. That's where your heart goes bad. Back strain, disc pain. Remember what I said? If it's not here, where is it? Disc pain that radiates down. Sound familiar? Itis. This gets rid of itis. Done. You got, you got a case of the itis? Boom. Here you go. Sciatica and whiplash. Oh, those are some of my favorite words. Okay. <laughs> uh, with these conditions, the management of the inflammatory process with proteolytic enzymes and antioxidants may well be the reason for the positive response. So they tested it and proven it. Here you go. Okay. As the name implies, the formula has been designed to be used for immediate immediately after injury in the acute inflammatory stages and in other cases when inflammation is present. I use this stuff all day, every day for tons of my patients, and it is amazing to watch people throw their other stuff away and be like, I need to get a couple of these. I'm going to take them with me on vacation. I'm going to have them in a medicine cabinet because this works better. So as science evolves, we come up with new options. Here we go. All right. The posture we have when using computers can lead to abnormal posture and neck pain. I would just like to point out that most of the people in these slides that have terrible posture are working on laptops. Okay. Bracing. A lot of people say, oh, if I, have, if I have a carpal tunnel, I can use a brace. And it's true. You can. And sometimes that's a good way to reduce your symptoms. But, because it does show effective after four weeks. So if you want, if you, want you can use that for four weeks. Uh, and eventually it'll get better. It improves the symptom severity. So you, it reduces pain. It does not address the long-term cause. So should you use a brace? Sure. Should you only use a brace? No.
All right, forward head posture is related to decreased range of motion of the neck. Pro-care versus home care. This is where we get into what you can do for yourself other than what we've mentioned before. Um, Pro-care, short to intermediate term length. We're gonna step in, we're gonna help you out, we're gonna dig you out of a hole, set you up and send you home. There you go. It's, people get better compliance. The, the number of people that don't do their home rehab is more than the people that do. So if you come in, we'll make sure that you're doing it. And there's a lot of reasons. It's not necessarily because they're lazy or because they're busy. Sometimes people don't know if they're doing it correctly. They, don't, they can't tell. So we can tell and we'll coach you through it. You get professional guidance. That's the awesome thing about coming in. Okay, intermediate to long-term care. If you're gonna do it at home, you gotta do it regularly. You're also gonna do it more frequently and you have a more flexible time frame. So do your best to take care of yourself. If you need professional help, come get us. All right, pro care. We do evaluation differential diagnosis. I think I've touched on this a couple of times. Um, a problem well defined is half solved. If you do not differentiate out what you're dealing with, you're gonna end up wearing a, a brace and taking a bunch of ibuprofen. Why? Because that's probably what everybody else is doing. And you know what happens? They eventually need surgery. I've worked on people that had four surgeries on one side, five surgeries on the other, and within about two weeks, we fixed 90% of the pain that never went away with those surgeries. Not terribly common, but it happens. Okay, differential diagnosis, treatment planning, so we plan out your care, actually apply the treatment, give you home care instructions, and then we re, then there's a uh, reevaluation periodically. So once we get you set up on a plan, we make sure that it's working. And then we make sure that you know what you're doing so that when you go home, you don't keep causing yourself the same problems. Our job is to fix you and send you home and then teach you how to fix yourself. And you know, people figure out how to break themselves. They, they ruin all my good work. And then they come back and we fix it again. It's okay. All right, so here's how you can be successful at home. Ready? This is what y'all been waiting for. Ta-da! Home care. Build a routine. Write down any questions about rehab. Why? Because if you write them down at the time you have them, you'll remember to ask them when, if you need professional help, you have the questions already prepared. Keep track of the successes and challenges with each activity. If there's something that works, you want to know what works. If, you want to know, if there's something that you're having trouble with, you want to know what that is. Stop if anything feels dangerous. There is a time and a place to do it yourself. There's a time and a place to ask for help. Knowing the difference is if it's dangerous. So here we have a bunch of different exercises. Wrist range of motion, front and back, side to side, do some stretches, do some stretches. If any of this stuff hurts, don't do it, okay? I had somebody ask me today, what happens if I do this and it hurts? I said, well, don't do that, right? But that's behavioral. On our continuum of ways to get you better, neurological, mechanical, chemical, behavioral. That's the least effective way to solve the problem. It's important to keep you safe, but it's not gonna fix the big problem. It's gonna make sure that you don't make worse ones. Okay, um, pectoralis stretch. Get in the door frame, get your arms back. You wanna get your wrist behind your elbow, your elbow behind your shoulder, and open up these muscles in, in here. Because if you're rolled forward, it pulls your whole posture down and forward. So a lot of times people wanna put their head up and back, and that's good, but you also wanna make sure that you're opening up the chest and keeping your body in your open posture this way. Scalene stretch. Remember the picture where we showed you all the muscles coming down this way? Those are the scalenes. Get side to side on it. Get your hands down and behind you, and you'll feel it accentuate. Go ahead and do that now. Everybody do that with me. Ready? Okay, hands down. Head side. I'm just doing this because my neck is kind of stiff. Oh, yeah, it's good. All right, then we go to the other side. Look at this. And then what you can do is take your nose, turn it to one side. Stretch. Stretch. And then take your nose, turn it to the other side. Stretch, stretch. There you go, ear to the shoulder. Okay, thoracic extension. Um, you ever sit back in a chair, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, and you feel stuff move? Well, you're not really trying to move your own bones. You just wanna stretch your muscles because if you slump, you wanna unslump. Uh, if it hurts to do it in a chair, you could lay down on the floor, use a towel, that's an option. Scapular squeeze, you pull your shoulder blades back together, why? because that's gonna open up your chest. Wrist extension, work your wrist muscles. If you're constantly like this all the time, you're going to become a statue. Grip strengthening. The muscles that go here and the muscles that go here are both related to grip. And if you are chronically using your hands all the time and you don't do anything to strengthen them, they are going to solidify and you're not gonna have a hand, you're gonna have a claw. And that hurts, okay. Have you flossed today? This right here, this is when they talk about neurodynamic. Neurodynamic, neurodynamic, neurodynamic testing. This is what they're talking about. So remember those nerves we talked about? So 
what you can do is basically coil everything up and then stretch everything out. If you do this and you get a little tingle in your first three fingers, what is that? It's the median nerve. Oh, oh look. Uh, yep. Oh uh, yeah. Uh huh. That's good stuff. Make sure you work your mouse hand extra. Because if you're doing this all the time, you're going to have some things that freeze up on you. And it's just this right here. That's awesome, right? Because what happens is when you do this, this is called nerve flossing. You're pulling the nerve because there's a coating around the outside of the nerve that's made out of collagen. Guess what your muscles are wrapped in? Collagen. Guess what your bones are wrapped in? Collagen. Guess what's just sort of everywhere in your body? Collagen. Collagen is what you get when you take the water out of gelatin. So if you've ever had jello that like gets stuck to the side of the pan and it like solidifies, that's collagen. It's tough and rubbery. What happens if you put a bunch of collagen next to each other, make it inflamed and leave it alone, it just glues itself together. Those are adhesions. And that can actually grab a hold of your nerve in all these different pinch points. So by stretching this way, you're not stretching your muscles. You're not stretching your, your ligaments or your tendons. You're actually flossing the nerve. You're breaking it free of all this glue that's holding it on. And guess what? That can liberate your nerves. Love it. This one is awesome. We use it in clinic all the time. Why does my back hurt? I don't know. Maybe because you sit like a puddle. There's a significant correlation between forward head posture and neck pain. If we've not drilled this in, you've not been paying attention. Okay. Um, why does my back always hurt? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because you stand like a spaghetti noodle. Okay. Up to 86% of people will have neck pain. If this happens, take care of it, please. Because if you can take care of your neck pain, it could turn into organ pain and wrist pain and also eye problems and sinuses and all sorts of other stuff. Okay. Why does my neck hurt? Uh, yeah, probably because of that. All right, so this is us. If you get the big idea, all else follows. ADIO stands for above, down, inside, out. Above, down, inside, out. If you have problems out here, check the core. Um, you want to reach out to us, adioclinic at gmail.com. Here's our phone number. Here's the website. Yeah, that's us. We're here to help. If you have questions, by all means, reach out. And if anybody wants to know where I got all the signs from, Boom. <laughs> I love PubMed, by the way. I don't know if uh, you all are up on this, but PubMed, you just type in stuff and it just pulls up research on pretty much anything you want. So if you want to know more about this, by all means, dig in. And if you find something cool, you better send it to me. I want to, if you find something that I didn't talk about that's relevant to what I'm talking about, send it to me. I will add it to my slides and then everybody will get smarter. And uh, yeah, that's a wrap. So thank you very much for attending and uh, we'll see you in the next one.